At the U.S. Supreme Court this week, does a 35-foot buffer zone around abortion clinics limit free speech? We'll speak with one of the plaintiffs in the case, Father Eric Caden, and court watcher Ed Whalen of the Ethics and Public Policy Center. And later, for two decades, they've been proving that opposites do attract political opponents and spouses. Mary Madeline and James Carville join us to discuss politics, faith, and their new book, Love and War. And finally, Rachel Campos Duffy, national spokesman for the Libre Initiative, joins us to discuss cultural stories of the week and a new campaign to promote the American dream. The world over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. James Carville and Mary Madeline are straight ahead. They'll be a lot of fun. Ed Whalen, Father Eric Caden, and Rachel Campos Duffy are also coming. As always, if you'd like to sound off on tonight's program, send your tweets to Raymond Arroyo or drop us an email at worldover at EWTN.com. Lots to get to, but first... Here's the brief news from the world over this week. It's been a busy week for Pope Francis. The Holy Father on Sunday announced his picks for the College of Cardinals, 19 in all. The Archbishop of Westminster, Vincent Nichols, and the Archbishop of Quebec, Gerald Cyprian Lacroix, were among those who will don the red hat at the Vatican on February 22nd. A side note, it will be the first time since 1979 that an American is not part of the consistory of new cardinals. And the Pope's appointments didn't end there. His reform of the Vatican continues. On Wednesday, four of the five cardinals who supervised the work of the Vatican Bank were replaced. The move comes less than a year after Pope Benedict confirmed those cardinals to a five-year term. Among them, former Secretary of State Cardinal Tarsicio Bertone, who was blamed by some for the Vatican's administrative shortcomings during Benedict's papacy. Officially known as the Institute for Religious Works, the Vatican Bank has been plagued by scandal and mismanagement that first became public in 2010. And earlier in the week, Pope Francis denounced abortion as horrific and evidence of a throwaway culture which is a threat to world peace. The Pope made the comment during a wide-ranging speech to the diplomatic corps accredited to the Vatican. He said, quote, It is frightful even to think that there are children victims of abortion who will never see the light of day, end quote. He further called for the elderly to be treated with respect and for children to be protected from exploitation, slavery, and hunger. We'll discuss the Pope's other big announcement with Rachel Campos Duffy later in the show. And staying in Rome, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry met with his Vatican counterpart, Cardinal-elect Pietro Parolin, on Tuesday. The first meeting between the two lasted for more than 90 minutes. According to the Vatican, the conversation centered on international issues, especially the Middle East, peace, and Syria. The U.S. bishop's concerns over the Obamacare HHS mandate were also discussed, according to the Vatican. That topic was missing from the State Department summary of the meeting. Kerry did announce, however, that President Barack Obama will soon pay Pope Francis a visit. A date has yet to be announced. Meanwhile, the Obama administration's plans to relocate the U.S. Embassy to the Holy See are on hold, for now. The U.S. House on Wednesday passed a $1.1 trillion spending bill that includes a stipulation that the State Department is not to move the Holy See Embassy to the campus of the Embassy for Italy. Several former ambassadors to the Holy See objected to the move, saying it would diminish America's profile with the Vatican. And a federal judge in Washington, D.C., has rejected a major challenge to the Obamacare law. U.S. District Judge Paul Friedman said that federal subsidies can be provided to people who buy plans regardless of whether their state 
set up an insurance exchange or not. Those challenging the Affordable Care Act argue that the letter of the law only stipulates that those subsidies are to be provided in states where such exchanges exist. The subsidies are a major funding mechanism for the Affordable Care Act, and without major state involvement, the system would collapse. Several states have filed suit on similar grounds. Oklahoma Attorney General Scott Pruitt said that his state's case continues, and he anticipates the issue will ultimately be decided by the Supreme Court. And for the second time in a month, a federal judge has single-handedly struck down a state law protecting traditional marriage. On Tuesday, Judge Terrence Kern, a Clinton appointee, declared Oklahoma's marriage amendment unconstitutional. He said the law, which defines marriage as the union of a man and a woman, creates an arbitrary, irrational exclusion of just one class of Oklahoma citizens from a governmental benefit. Judge Kern stayed his decision pending appeal. A judge in Utah last month declared that state's marriage law unconstitutional as well, leading to a thousand same-sex marriages in the following days. And the Catholic Church continues to deal with its clerical abuse crisis around the world and here in the U.S. On Thursday, a U.N. Committee on the Rights of the Child in Geneva grilled Vatican officials over their handling of the global crisis. The Vatican insisted that there is no excuse for child abuse. Archbishop Silvano Tomasi said that local law enforcement had the jurisdiction to punish abusers. The Vatican conceded that more needs to be done and promised to build on progress already made to become a model for other organizations. And the Archdiocese of Chicago has released thousands of pages of documents detailing clergy sex abuse allegations in the hopes of bringing healing to the victims and their families. This is according to Auxiliary Bishop Francis Kane, who spoke Wednesday during a news conference in downtown Chicago. He said the documents will reveal that the Archdiocese, quote, made mistakes. Sometimes it was because we didn't know any better, end quote. The nation's third largest archdiocese agreed to release the documents pertaining to 30 priests with substantiated abuse allegations as part of a settlement deal. Before their public release, attorneys will remove information to protect the anonymity of victims. Meanwhile, the Archdiocese of St. Louis was recently ordered by a court to release a list of its priests who have been accused of sexual abuse. At the same time, two dioceses in Minnesota are asking courts to postpone the deadline for releasing lists of all its accused priests. The Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minnesota, and the Diocese of Winona are arguing that only the names of credibly accused priests should be released. And the Diocese of Stockton, California, on Wednesday filed for bankruptcy, stemming from millions of dollars of liability from their abuse settlements. And finally, on a much lighter and needed note, some Trappist monks in Massachusetts, say that five times fast, have decided to adopt one of the order's long and storied European traditions, beer making. For more than a century, Trappist monks in Belgium, Holland, and Austria have been brewing what many beer lovers consider to be the best beers in the world. The Trappist monks in the U.S., they're better known for their jellies, jams, coffees, and coffins. But on Thursday, the 63 brothers of St. Joseph's Abbey, just outside of Boston, will join their European brethren selling the first Trappist beer brewed outside of Europe. The monks' new multi-million dollar state-of-the-art brewery is apparently the envy of the microbrewery world. Their first brew, called the Spencer Trappist Ale, is touted as an all-American brew cloudy and golden. No word if the monks will offer a beer and coffin package. Celebrate and dispatch in one order. Up next, a plaintiff in the Supreme Court's abortion clinic buffer zone case. Father Eric Caden and court watcher Ed Whalen of the Ethics and Public Policy Center join us when the World Over Live continues. Stay right there. Now, 
once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. Oral arguments were heard this week by the United States Supreme Court in the Massachusetts case of McCullen versus Coakley. At issue is the constitutionality of a 35-foot buffer zone around abortion clinics in Massachusetts. The state says the zones are necessary to ensure public safety. Pro-life activists say it's an infringement upon their free speech. Here to shed some light on what is at stake in this case is one of the plaintiffs, Father Eric Caden, via satellite from Boston, and constitutional law expert and president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, Ed Whalen, joins me in studio. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us. Father, I want to start with you. You are a plaintiff in this case. What is your gripe? What, what are you upset yes. about here? I'm upset that we, the plaintiffs, don't have an opportunity to speak in a gentle, loving way to the women and the men who are walking into these facilities, to offer them the real and concrete support and love that we have. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Eleanor uh, McCullen, who is uh, a friend of yours, one of the, the, the primary plaintiff, uh, she, I suppose, goes mm -hmm. out and counsels these girls. So it's really not a uh, protest, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but w what is the right. difficulty that this 35-foot zone doesn't allow you? A number of things. The first is, as the, the women, and sometimes with the men with them, as they're approaching and, and we engage them in a real, gentle, loving conversation, mm -hmm. and, and they engage us back at times. Um, as we're walking, when you hit that line and we have to stop, it it throws things off. It, it, it puts a question in their mind of, well, why do they have to stop? Mm. If they really can help me, then what would this line be doing? Mm. And, Ed, and so it puts us in a very awkward situation. Ed Whalen, I want to go to you for a moment. Uh, the Attorney General uh, Coakley, Martha Coakley of Massachusetts, says all we're trying to do is regulate traffic. This is for the, in the public interest. You would say what? Well, there are plenty of ways that it can regulate traffic without barring pro-life sidewalk counselors mm -hmm. from engaging in peaceful speech on public sidewalks. Mm -hmm. Remember, these 35-foot zones extend into uh, over public sidewalks, classic public forums in, in Supreme Court First Amendment jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. This is the most protected First Amendment territory imaginable, and the idea that 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 peaceful speakers can't engage in, uh, for, in, in speech on those sidewalks is outrageous. What's more, and this came out in the oral argument yesterday, the uh, employees of the abortion clinic are perfectly free to stand on that sidewalk in that space mm. where father can't go and say, this facility is very safe. Father has no ability to respond to that except perhaps to yell, no, it's not, which isn't a very mm. good way to... Uh, yeah, win people over, yeah, right. or, or, or help them, in the, uh, as the case may be. Right. So is the argument then, the legal argument, Ed, is it that, as Mark Rienzi said, who is the attorney arguing on behalf of uh, Mrs. McCullen, that uh, this is a selective free speech zone? That's part of the argument. That is that the that the ban is not viewpoint neutral. It's mm -hmm. viewpoint discriminatory. Again, it's uh, barring. It's also barring speech in a traditional public forum, in the most protected areas. So yes, that's that's uh, that's very much at the core of the argument. Plus, again, the state has plenty of other means mm -hmm. to achieve its objective. If anyone is is uh, going to engage in improper conduct, that uh, that can you know that person can be enjoined. People who you know, so-called bad actors, there are ways of stopping them. There are other uh, laws that can be used against actual obstruction, for example. There's mm -hmm. a federal law from, from 1994, the, the so-called Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act, right. that can uh, bar obstruction. No, this is overkill that is clearly designed to prevent the, the sort of peaceful sidewalk counseling that uh, Father and uh, Mrs. McCullen engage in. I, I want to give the audience a sense of uh, Eleanor McCullen. Here is a little bite from her. This is outside the court. Listen, and then, Father, I'll get your reaction. Here I am, gentle, loving, and I can tell you this, it's worth my time, big time, because I get many, many calls. Eleanor, thank you for being there. Thank you. You stopped us. We have our little boy today. It's the joy of our heart. 
it's a challenge, but thank you. I get so many thank yous that it's worth trying to not miss one person. Father, even uh, Nina Totenberg and people who probably wouldn't side with your friend Eleanor McCullen mm -hmm. were very taken with her. How big a role do you think her personality is going to play in swaying not only public opinion, but perhaps the Supreme Court? I think it, it plays a, an enormous role. The, she is a woman who, with passion and with zeal, loves these women and these men who come in okay. and, and cares and her sincerity is obvious and it's profoundly attractive. And one of the things I noticed just being in the courtroom as the arguments were going on is there seemed to be a general um, concession from all the justices, from both legal sides, that Eleanor McCullen in particular, the rest of the petitioners as well, but her in particular, is not who this law is directed towards. But she and, and we suffer from the law. Okay. And, and it was a very peculiar thing because she is someone who brings such a tenderness and is so in love with Jesus, with his church, with the truth of the beauty of life, that it's contagious. And, and people, as we're on the sidewalk, are drawn to her. Mm -hmm. because they're looking for someone who can look to them in the eye and mean it and say, I can help you. And mm -hmm. she does. Mm -hmm. uh, Ed, uh, the, let's put this in some context. The Supreme Court upheld a two th in 2000 a law that uh, would keep an eight-foot buffer zone around an abortion clinic. Why would they change the ruling this time? Well, the law was actually broader than that in the 2000 case. There was a 100-foot zone around an abortion clinic, and you couldn't get within eight, eight, eight feet of someone within that zone. Oh, okay. You could enter the zone, but not uh, be within eight feet. Mm -hmm. uh, even uh, Harvard Law Professor Larry Tribe, who's as ardently on the pro-abortion side as anyone, says that case was slam dunk simple and slam dunk wrong. Again, mm -hmm. it was regulating speech on a public sidewalk, barring peaceful speech by speakers on a public sidewalk. This case, uh, the law is different. Uh, it's a complete uh, ban on entering the 35-foot zone. Right. So, in, so in some respects, uh, a number of respects, it's, it's more extreme than that 2000 law. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, will the court uh, distinguish away that, that 2000 ruling? Will it overrule it or will it, or will it extend it? And, mm. and uphold this Massachusetts yeah. statute. Uh, it was surprising that Justice Elena Kagan raised the question of why is this buffer zone so broad? Why is it so wide? Were you struck by that? Well, I think it's a natural question to arise. I don't know that it particularly signals uh, where she'll be on this, but I think it's uh, you know an opportunity for the for the state to explain uh, its case uh, for why the, the zone is what it is. What's interesting is Justice Breyer asked uh, a, a question of uh, the state's lawyer. Said, "What's the uh, evidence that the legislature had in deciding to?" To, to enact this law. And the, the answer that the state lawyers gave, the primary evidence she cited was abusive conduct by what she called pro-choice advocates right. against pro-lifers. So this is a mm. classic example of a, of a heckler's veto, where the abusive conduct of the other side is used suddenly to prevent pro-lifers from right. engaging in the sidewalk counseling. Planned Parenthood is apparently using a similar argument for why this buffer zone is needed. This is uh, Marty Walls mm -hmm. reacting to the reasoning for this. The genesis is really the behavior outside of our health centers in the late 1980s and through the 1990s. We were subject to um, harassment and blockades. We so they're making that very case that uh, well here okay. they're, here they're that that argument focuses on pro-life conduct from a long time ago. Mm -hmm. The question that the state the, the state's lawyer was answering is why the uh, statute that Massachusetts uh, enacted, I believe, in 2000, right. had to be expanded in 2007. Mm -hmm. And she, for that, was citing the, uh, primarily the, the uh, hostile actions of, of uh, pro-choice uh, folks within the zone. Mm -hmm. Father, where do you think this is going to end up, and what are your hopes here? 
my hopes are that, hope, hopefully optimistic, that the law will be struck down. So that one of the things Justice Scalia was saying, which is true, is for most of us out there, we're not protesting abortion. We are counseling and providing real alternatives and help and hope and love to these women and to these men and for these unborn children. And we're confident that as we, the night before even, had offered a mass and we're praying to our God, who's not a God of death, but a God of life, that the truth of our message, the truth of our help, the truth of our love would come through. And that justices of all, of the, all over the spectrum would, would see that and know that, that the work we're doing is good and is not abusive, is not uh, combative, but is loving. Very good. Fa Father, uh, I want to go to Ed before we, we run out of time. Your thoughts on this. Where do you think this will end up, given what you heard in these oral arguments? Well, the oral argument provided plenty of signs of hope. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been burned before in trying to predict <laughs> where the court will go. I'm optimistic here, uh, but one could easily see it as a splinter decision mm -hmm. where it's tough to cobble together exactly what the holding is. But I, I, I think at this point you may well end up with uh, five or six or seven justices saying that there's something seriously problematic uh, with this statute. Why do you think the court decided not to hear an appeal to reinstate Arizona's abortion ban? They pushed that away. Well, I think that uh, my, my guess is that uh, Justice Kennedy wasn't interested in uh, voting to uphold that uh, vo voting to uphold that law, mm -hmm. and uh, other justices then weren't interested in giving him an opportunity to knock it down. Mm. Uh, the law pre presented a, a challenge to the viability line that uh, that Kennedy had. Uh, embraced in Planned Parenthood v. Casey in 1992, mm. uh, and uh, I, 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 again, I, my, my guess is that um, Justice Kennedy uh, is going to, going to stick to his guns on uh, what, what, what he did back in Planned Parenthood v. Casey. Humility is not one of his uh, uh, leading virtues, and to, to revisit that and to recognize his error, I think, may be something that uh, we uh, can't expect from him. I like the charitable way you put that. Not one of his greater virtues, <laughs> Ed Whalen. Uh, Father Eric Caden, thank you so much for being here. Coming up, Mary Madeline and James Carville talk about their marriage, politics, their new home, and their New York Times best-selling memoir, Love and War. This ought to be fun. The World of Alive continues in a moment. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. When people say that opposites attract, they might have had my next guests in mind. For the last two decades, they have individually advised Presidents Bill Clinton, George Bush, George W. Bush, and Vice President Dick Cheney. Politically, they agree on little, yet they've been happily married for more than 20 years. They met on the campaign trail in 1992 when they occupied opposing camps, one working for Clinton, the other working for the incumbent George Bush. She is Mary Madeline, the Republican. He is James Carville, the Democrat. When this odd couple married, some thought it was a stunt, but their union has lasted. And a few years ago, they relocated from Washington, D.C. to the South. In their new book, Love and War, 20 Years, Three Presidents, Two Daughters, and one Louisiana home. They write about the things that unite them, divide them, their faith, and their bold decision to move to post-Katrina New Orleans. Here's my interview with Mary Madeline and James Carville. I want to start with two quick political things before we get into this great book. First of all, Chris Christie, we are hearing about this bridge gate. Now they're investigating his use of the Sandy relief funds. Is this an example of the media running after a story that really doesn't have national importance? I'm not saying this is a partisan. I'm just saying it as a 35-year person who's been doing this. The obsession with the presidential contest, which is way off in the distance, we still have a very important midterm to go through, is, is increasing 
each year, and this one is ridiculous. Whatever happen is happening today is going to have no impact on Christie's 2016 ambitions, should he have any. James? Well, first of all, Bridgegate, yeah, I mean, this is all, uh, come on, if, if somebody done endorse you and you <laughs> shut three lanes down on the busiest bridge in the world for four days, of course that's a story. On the Sandy thing, I am totally sympathetic with, the Christie, with Christie on this. First of all, he was the face of the recovery. Mm -hmm. The actual firm they hired it gave 75% of its contribution to Democrats. Right. They negotiated the contract down. The ads were really effective. You know, the most famous ad a state's ever run promotional ad was Tom Kane, you in yep. New Jersey, yep. perfect together. And so I, from everything that I have read about the, the mm -hmm. contract of Christie being the, the face of come back to the Jersey right. shore, it seems to me to be that they handle that pretty good. What about the Hillary story we're hearing uh, I, today about the hit list that's come out? This doesn't uh, strike me as a hit list. It was a list that a guy, Chris is the most mild-mannered guy, it was a list they had during the campaign of the people who endorsed him who didn't endorse him. I know of no campaign that would not have any such thing. It, it was just a list, and it, it's just... It has to be a story, and it's 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 nothing. We don't call those hit lists. We call those long memories. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know enough about politics. Oh, I don't and get this, well, yeah, and, No and hit list here, Mary. <laughs> I said what, what she should do is announce that she's going to be bipartisan. She's going to make Chris Christie the secretary of retribution. <laughs> <laughs> is she going to run, James? I, I, I would be, I would not be surprised if she ran, but I would not be shocked if she didn't. Mm. So I, I, and I hope I, she I, does. More likely to, probably I hope a little she more does because I have two daughters. I like to see women in politics, and I and for one reason, two reasons. I know we can beat her. Uh, <laughs> with who? Some people say this Issues. whole some some people Issues. say this whole campaign against Christie is to get him off the Issues. stage quickly. So he's not the only guy. He's not the only boy at the dance. Well, I never thought. I, look, I never thought Christie had a chance to beat a Republican nominee from the get-go. Mm -hmm. This reduces, which I thought, the chance of zero to be in, I don't know how you yeah. go lower than that, but I never <laughs> thought Negative was, something. Having but. said that, someone like Scott Walker, a governor who has a record of conservative policies that have succeeded, I think is going to, or that's how the hierarchy of the primary is going to you be. You think he could beat Hillary Clinton? Do I think Scott Walker yes. could beat Hillary Clinton in this economy mm -hmm. off of the Obama record? Yes, sir, I do. Okay. Well, okay. If, he, if he was just able Dinner to Dinner at your right. grampa's. Okay. Right. If he was we'll just it. able to come close to doing as well as the Minnesota economy, he might have a chance. <laughs> okay, we'll all right. Be nice now. I don't want to... I want love, not war today, okay? <laughs> Get the, involved. The book Get involved. is... The book... I love this book. It's totally what I did not expect. I thought it was going to be a largely a political tome. It ends up really being a love letter to the city and a curious love letter between two people who on the surface seem mismatched. As you read this book, you realize how simpatico you all are on so many things. We should start the New Orleans story of the very first place that James made the entire family go to make us understand that sugar, we could be a sliver on a river. <laughs> Raymond's grandpa's restaurant. Oh, well, sure, God, Tony. Yeah, you know, what, what a, what, when you go look at your, your grandfather's restaurant and you see that picture of how high the water, water was. was. 20 feet. And, took, and, yes. Reached the top of the roof at Tony Angelo's. And, 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 and people, I, I think people don't realize, A, how far, how treacherous this thing was mm -hmm. and how problematic it is. And now that things are going so well, it, it was sort of taken for granted. That was no way near the case and there's, there's any number of, of sort of stories there, but we are but the spirit Gareth, of your uh, grandfather, who at his age, literally, literally mm -hmm. underwater, yeah. what did he do? Rebuilt. Five years. Took him five years yeah, to rebuild. Five years. But, but when you go in there, and I, first of all, it's a terrific restaurant, mm -hmm. but when you go in there, you should see, and when I do my tours, if it's closed, I show them where when, pe well, when people are gas, the but, but but he was but, but you know he was right there by Seventeenth Street. I mean he, Two he was blocks ground from the levee break, ground zero. Mm -hmm. I mean that and, and you know it's, it's some places like our house did not get water. Right. You know it it, right. it, 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 it depended, but where that part of the city, and it, you know it's done very well at whole Har that, that part of the city has, has bounced back mm -hmm. nicely. Well, you don't need has. to promote the restaurant. You can't get a reservation there unless you're, where you're with you. No. Uh, but his, the epitomizes the resilience and the resolve of the people and how much they love the city. James writes something in the book that I love that jumped out at me. He says, we have a shared history. I'll never be among strangers here. 
and that, it, it was clearly the tug of the blood, but what was it that first made you all think of leaving D.C.? You'd been here for decades. I loved New Orleans before I knew James Carver. We got married in New Orleans. It's the last bastion, bastion of authentic eccentrics, and I say that, <laughs> I say that with love and affection. I, there's just nothing about it I haven't loved. It's not an anti-D.C. thing. It was just mm -hmm. a pro paradise thing. Hmm. Uh, uh, yeah. Go ahead. What, what, what is it? What uh, is it about the, the tug of New Orleans, James, that drags um, us all back, it seems? Well, I, I, I do think that the events of August 2005 probably, you know, made it more of a sense of purpose going back. It is. And, and I, I've never, ever felt like I was from anywhere else but Louisiana. Mm -hmm. I just put it in the book. I just, I, I never felt, I mean, I, I live here, it was fine, my kids went to school here, uh, but, but I never home. felt at home. Mm -hmm. And from the day that we moved back until this day, I've always felt that, hey, this is where I'm from. I'm, I'm among my people. I, the way I, I said it in a, when I was asked by when the Washington Post, you know, first story first came out. I said, "Look, I'm just an old Jew. I'm just going back to Jerusalem." I mean, mm. just, just, <laughs> well, you, you know say here, I, I wanted to get back home before home disappeared. It was frightening. He's a great writer, but speaking of being an old Jew, our, our mutual friend Monsignor Nalti mm -hmm. remarried us. Right at St. Stephen's. At St. Stephen's, and he thought his grandparents had been married at. I thought they were married at Monte Della Rosa because my grandmother grew up. In the old city of Carrollton over there, on the, right. oh, actually on the Hickory Street, on the other side of, I guess it would be the west side of Carrollton Avenue. And for some reason, I always thought that that's where they got married. And it turns out that they got married in April of 1910 at St. Stephen's. So that wouldn't have been a no our normal. to the month. That to the month. Oh, my God. They're doing marriage certificates in the book. I love that. Yeah, and you stole it and put it in your office, I heard. You know, yeah. Yeah, right. Monsignor <laughs> gave it to me. He in his office. Office. Thank and dug you, up Monsignor Nolte. Tell me about that. You and your conversion to Catholicism, which happened in what, 2008? What was that slow? Was that a long process? Was it fast? What happened there? The face of God, the hand of God, you could not miss it if you saw what was being done post Katrina in New Orleans. And then if you have a person in your life like Christopher Nolte, who had returned, had been sent back from the Vatican mm -hmm. to help. I mean, there's just a confluence of so many events. And the, I'm a faith and reason kind of girl. There's too much. It's just like. We've had the great privilege of being together with oh. to, at the conclave. You right. have the new pope. So what's to, I mean, it just is. James is an altar boy. He never pressured me, but I think he's pretty happy that that we are, we can, he now can go to confession again. <laughs> <laughs> James, has it changed you at all, Mary's conversion? Deepened your faith at all? Changed it? I think so. Uh, you know, in, in, uh, in a bad, obviously, the, the new pope has had a very positive impact on, on, on me. I think it's had a very positive impact on everybody else. And I think, the, you know, the, the church, it's, it, it stays the same, but while it stays the same, it has to change. And I think it, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're seeing that. And we, we're very fortunate to have Monsignor Nolte. Uh, Monsignor Nolte. We have a, you know, it's a Bishop very... Bishop Amen is a I, I like the, the framework, mm -hmm. if you will. Uh, it's what grew up over to say children in a, you know, big... Catholic, 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 very, household, very yeah. Catholic, very, you know, fr French, Louisiana, mm. South Louisiana family. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, well, I've, in my lifetime, I've seen the church go through a lot. Not all good, but I think mm -hmm. now but it's sort of good because we're seeing a lot more good things happening than bad things, mm -hmm. and that, that's always a good thing. I agree. Let's talk for a moment about the things that you all very frankly discuss here that are challenges to the marriage over these many years, beginning with Mary's animals. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you, I didn't know this about you. I mean, until I, the one time I came to your house, I did notice then, uh, you know. It's what did you notice? Well, are you about to call me a crazy cat? No, lady? no, no, but it's a little bit like Mutual of Omaha in there. I mean, you've got all <laughs> kinds of things running around and you hear them pawing at doors. And, I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot happening, Mary, that doesn't have to happen that way, as I often tell my wife. I'm with James on this, I have to tell you, but go ahead, tell well, me, explain this. Well, as is Monsignor Nalti, as is everybody, first I would like to say that New Orleans and Louisiana in general are, is an animal-loving place, and there were a lot of animals abandoned. Uh, that's true. After Katrina, and the cats are hard to have been adopted. So a number of them, sure. 
It's a little odd to have a number of semi-feral cats running <laughs> through your house and eating your butter off the cabinet. And I agree with you, that's a little annoying. But mm -hmm. I'm always, but I was on the Humane Society here <laughs> and I'm in Washington and I liked, uh, like animals and I think every child should grow up with pets and... Uh, Okay, so you're all against me on that. Yeah, I, you know, look, I, I could ride a horse before I could ride a bike. I, had, I actually had a blue ribbon parish fair winning pig I raised. I uh, feel a butt coming on. <laughs> right. I do not like animals in food prep areas. Indoors. In, in mine, yeah. So, yeah. You write, anyway, somebody writes like in the book I don't, about I don't mix. I don't, there is I don't, a Louisiana kind of unsaid code. You keep animals outside, Mary. Right. You don't let them in the house. Yeah. I, I, and I don't. <laughs> now my wife hasn't learned this lesson either, and I have one running around, but only one little dog. But uh, you know, you got to draw the lines. Okay, and then, I, they, but every month, you know, to everybody, we have a lot of cooking in there. Yeah. Everybody brings right. their own kill. Right. Okay, you can have them running well, around that's in your backyard. We're eating it. We're not letting it. So it's right. it's standard I, I just, on know, the top it, of the it, food. It, that's just me. I don't like animals and food prep. <laughs> right? no, I, I, I'm not going to change. We have had much bigger fights about that, and more of them than the minimum wage mm. or right. whatever. It's right. those things. It's not the ideological thing. Well, you do talk about the Iraq War, which I imagine yes. was a huge stumbling block. Which yeah. we're not going to talk about right. now. Okay, we won't bring that up now. Okay, but uh, let's talk about James, who at one point you complain in the book. You never thought he was listening to you or giving you his full attention, and later he's diagnosed as having ADHD. Real ADHD, and you know, you, you know how you learn from your children. Our, both of our girls have processing issues. I don't think of it as a defect, or they mm -hmm. call it uh, associate, whatever it is, a defect is what the, what the acronym stands for. It's mm -hmm. not a defect. They are not victims. Mm -hmm. They are geniuses, as he is a genius. You have to be challenged. You have to be channeled the right way to, mm -hmm. to learn the right way. So, in learning how to work with my daughters, which mothers just are instinctual about sure. it, I, the light went off. Wow! I wonder if this is in the gene pool. <laughs> and of course, it was in the gene pool. But I respected his not wanting to. He has structured his whole life around dealing with these Marines. He's, he's mm -hmm. a structured Marine guy, and that's the way that you have to do it. And how has it changed you since the diagnosis, James? I don't know if it's changed. I mean, it was a very professionally done thing. It wasn't some, you know, uh -huh. hit and run. Fly thing. By well, night. A, lot, a lot of tests, a lot of, you know. Uh, but I think it, it, I know it's explainable. Just to, to know mm -hmm. something is to, to, is, is to, and to some extent, it's sort of liberating, I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, and I structure my life around it. I, I know mm. I can't sit still for a long time. I know I'm unable to do things that some things that other people can do, and, and mm. I, I, it's okay. It's you, when I, As, after we got married, yes. So he this, he, he hadn't been at confession for thirty years. Okay. It's a kind of, of, it's that kind of a thing that no. you don't talk about yeah. in public. But <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Yeah, public, yeah. Mary, okay. But okay, I am right. sorry. I don't right. know. I know. It's just, kind of He's people. just fast right. at everything. James, <laughs> as I read the book, I was kind of surprised because people, and I, I think both of you have sort of fallen into, people have created little boxes that they put you both in. As you read this book, you come away with reeling that, a feeling that neither of you are really ideologues at heart. In fact, James, when he's not hiding under the brim of that hat from my cameras, is uh, <laughs> you're actually much more of a traditionalist. When, as I read this, I thought, here's a guy who's he's willing to change his life to preserve his culture. He's he's somebody who understands the the beauty of that culture right. and 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 family. Well, I, you know, most people describe themselves as fiscal conservatives and socially liberal. I describe myself as economically liberal and socially traditionalist. Now, mm -hmm. I do. There's, there's some issues that I'm, would not be considered so traditional on. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I do, and I've written a book about this, I think that the preferable way for a child to grow up is with two parents. And you know, I know it's not always possible, but I think that's a, the, a preferable way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, ideally, uh, you know, if people say, what's the advice for a successful life? You know, uh, get married, stay married, go to school, stay in school. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that we need to look down or anything else of, of, mm -hmm. of non-traditional families, which is certainly a, the way. And but I would prefer, all things being equal, I would prefer that my children would grow up like that. But mm -hmm. that's just my own personal 
view, if mm -hmm. you will. And I, I got married once. I've been married once in my life. I got married when I was 49. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I tell people. I, Waiting for the right one. That's it. <laughs> and, and Mary, you come away, uh, as I read this, you come away, your appreciation of nature, uh, your love of animals, all these things, these are not traditionally, you know, Cheney <laughs> conservatism. Yes, it doesn't Cheney quite reek of that. Cheney is a conservatism, but I would call, I do think I'm an ideologue, and I do think my Catholicism explained it to him and gave me language for it. It's subsidiarity, it's solidarity, it's, mm -hmm. so these philosophies all merge. But for the record, Dick okay. Cheney is a conservationist. <laughs> okay. Conservation is a virtue, it's you just not an energy You plan. don't work for him anymore, Madeline, it's I, okay. I, I love the You're man. not on retainer anymore. <laughs> Let's talk for a second, final thing. What's the biggest policy challenge and the biggest challenge of this town, D.C., now with your perspective, not living here any longer? You see what? Uh, 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 we, we do have a daughter at school here, so we are in and out of here. Mm -hmm. I don't think the biggest challenge is to kumbaya, compromise. Mm -hmm. It's to, like, you. it's structural debt, the structural debt. I'm not, mm -hmm. which includes health care, mm -hmm. social security, all the entitlements, all those programs that don't even have to go through reauthorization. But they what is it about this town, though, Mary? There's something about this town. People don't, they're, they're, they're so divided. They're so, so, people don't talk to each other here. It's a cold place, let's face it. There are relationships, yes, around the edges, but by and large, this is a pretty cold place. Look, uh, first of all, every time we a problem, I think of all the problems we have, the debt is pretty far down the road right now. We have a um, personal view is, is that the biggest problem this country faces is we haven't, in for a long time, we haven't been able to get ordinary people's income to grow. Mm. And that somehow or another there's this kind of promise at the end of the day that things will be better and this, since 1973. For a lot of people, we've been pretty flat here, and the solutions are probably long range and not easy. But and I, and I do think that the biggest problem in Washington is not ideology; it is just swimming in money, mm -hmm. and it's just so much money that prevents so many things from yeah, on I every kind of level, that. you know. And, uh, and it's not campaign money; it's all the it's, it's lobbying, some it's lobbying, 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 lobbying money, right, every right. Er, everything. It's just it's just. Uh, it's just really swimming in money, and it, it, it prevents a lot, I think, from happening, and, a lot, and oftentimes the wrong things happen. Just mm -hmm. not to say we're not pro-money. We're pro-money. <laughs> no, everybody's pro-money, but it does, it does have a problem. It begins to corrupt the process in a way that I think right. people outside of it don't realize. Right. Corrode the process. Yeah. What, what should be your lasting political legacy? Each of you, I want to answer this. What would you like to have as your legacy in government? That... Uh, I would like my daughters and their offspring to know that loyalty is a very, very, very important virtue. Loyalty and humility, which you have to have a lot of in politics, I think, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I hope people remember me as a guy that took what he did seriously but didn't take himself seriously. That's a pretty safe one. That is a pretty safe one. You know, Hey, you know, he had fun doing what he did. Well, I have to tell you, I love this book for, for a multiplicity of reasons. It is a, it's a fast read, a fun read, and I really feel I know you all better, and I think others will enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. The book Love and War, 20 Years, Three Presidents, Two Daughters, and One Louisiana Home is available at bookstores everywhere. Now, in the book, James Carville claims to be a cafeteria Catholic, but I'm sure between Mary and Monsignor Nolte, that too may be evolving. As Pope Francis might say, who am I to judge? When we return, we'll take a stroll through the pop culture with Rachel Campos Duffy and talk about an unexpected papal announcement on breastfeeding. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. My next guest was a cast member of MTV's The Real World San Francisco in the mid-1990s. She's been a frequent guest host on ABC's The View, as well as a columnist and blogger. She's now the national spokesman for the Libre Initiative, an organization for advancing economic empowerment in the Hispanic community. I sat down with Rachel Campos Duffy a little earlier to discuss the cultural stories of the week, and the new Share the Dream campaign. Take a look. 
Rachel, I want to start with this MTV show, which you have some background with mm -hmm. MTV sure. and reality television, which we're going to talk about in a second. 16 and Pregnant. Now, uh, some researchers have looked at this, and they've seen the teen pregnancy rate drop as the ratings for this show go up. Is that a good thing or perhaps a not so good thing? You know, I've always had conflicted feelings about mm -hmm. um, that show. Mm -hmm more positive than negative, I will uh -huh. say. Okay. And part of it is, unless you see it, I mean, you know as a parent, mm -hmm. unless you are actually being a parent, yeah. you don't know how difficult it is. You don't know what it's like to, to lose your freedom, sure. to have this. And so this is really the first time teenage girls have been able to see what yeah. that's really like. So that doesn't surprise me. For a teenager. Me. For a mm -hmm. teenager to see what it's like for another teen to do it. And so I do mm -hmm. think it's a cautionary tale. Mm -hmm. um, I also think the show has been very subversively pro-life. Um, mm. and, and in fact, there was a, a time when the pro-choice people were trying to do a a version of that where the girl chooses abortion. It never got off the ground mm -hmm. because it's really not there's nothing. Yeah, it's not the, happiest, yeah, it's not the happiest. Not the happiest ending. ending yeah. <laughs> right, and but, so in this one, you see the difficulties, but you also see the joy, which is what parenting is about. You mm -hmm. see the joy of the grandparents. You see, um, you know, all of it, and mm -hmm. so I think that's good. And I also think that um, you know, it's probably a positive that these mm -hmm. girls are, are 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 choosing to look at this and and make another choice. Now, some people say this this encourages, it glamorizes teen pregnancy, and it may be encouraging contraceptive use. Your thoughts? It encourages a lot of bad behavior in that you see these boyfriends have like free reign in their, the girl's parents' house, they open the fridge, they're like, you know, uh -huh. it's obvious that premarital sex is, um, is, is kind of a non-issue in this. So mm -hmm. definitely as a Christian parent, watching it with your teenager could be a good thing, but you'll want to watch Mm -hmm. and sort of guide them through all of that because it is a moral um, minefield, if you will. <laughs> yeah, no, well, and that's with any, I think it's with any program, particularly today, yes. whether it's something on Nickelodeon or Disney. I mean, mm -hmm. you've always got to watch it with your kids and know who's there and what the message is. That's right. Absolutely. Let's talk for a moment about this uh, study, as long as we're talking about mm -hmm. TV viewing and kids. Sure. There's a Japanese study out, and it says increased TV viewing, and I want to get this right, causes a child's brain to structurally change. It adds to the gray matter, the fat of the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, should we, be, <laughs> should we be turning the TVs off at home? I think I have a lot of gray matter in my own brain, I maybe. Think you and me both. <laughs> um, you know, obviously, it, it can be a crutch. We, do, uh, we don't want our kids just plopped in front. But I would be lying to you if I didn't tell you that I used the TV as a babysitter to get chores done in my house. It happens. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, again, about being very selective. When you do let them do it, what are they watching? Mm -hmm. um, and there are good choices. EWTN has great cartoon no, choices. No, they have some children's yeah. programming things, and some of the shows, I mean, even some of the network programs, they're fine. Yeah. You just have to be selective. And Very selective. I, I worry, though, about the prolonged, they just sit there, and they can watch the same episode. I know. SpongeBob. Mm -hmm. They can watch SpongeBob, the same episode, over and over. See, I think when I read this study, my first thought was, it's not the viewing, it's the sedentary nature of the body at the time. You're just sitting there like a potato right. for hours. Because yes. you're not moving, I think it's probably contributing to the brain And it's loss. what's not happening, right? You're not reading. They're not, they're not playing running. outside. They're not, they're not playing with their toys and having imaginative play. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. I want to talk about eight. LA parenting trend, and you being oh, yeah. <laughs> a, 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 a mother once again, you yes. will, you will uh, mm -hmm. particularly, I mean, you've been a mother all along, but a new mother a again. A new mother again. Uh, this thing is called RIE, RI, mm -hmm. and it stands for Resources for Infant Educarers. Mm -hmm. The basic parenting, parenting approach here is treat the kid like an adult. Mm -hmm. No more baby talk, no toys. Your thoughts <laughs> on this parenting approach? Well, on the positive side, I think it's better than that entitled, spoiled, anything goes, indulgent. you know, indulgent. And you see kids that can't even sit straight in a chair because they've never been told to do anything, mm -hmm. you know, with, with discipline. I do think that it's interesting, the idea of treating kids with dignity. I think that's important. You know, mm -hmm. I never liked the idea of people who feed their kids without plates or on the floor. I do think that 
they should be, they're uncivilized. We, it is our job to civilize this them, not, right? This yeah. is not a, 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 a den so the, at the zoo. Exactly, yeah. and so there's an aspect of it that's very interesting. What I don't like is I don't like anything that's very trendy in parenting, because inevitably mm -hmm. it never works. I think that there's something very um, organic and natural about parenting, and, mm -hmm. and whatever happened to just plain old common sense right. and um, but I, maybe these people need someone they need to pay someone <laughs> to tell them to use a plate or not baby oh talk and gosh. I'll I mean, pay they can pay me to but, do it. But no <laughs> toys I mean come on yeah, no it's, toys it's, it's they silly. let them cry let them cry well they're not adults that's why you're a parent. I agree. I mean why don't we do away with babysitters see how long <laughs> you know you can go out with that scene That would be on. so cheap for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah you'd like that just seven wild You have no idea around. how much I spend <laughs> <laughs> a babysitter for a night out. Now, I want to talk about, you are part of the Libre Initiative, which yes. is a group that encourages entrepreneurship and, and, and liberty. Uh, focusing on the Hispanic population, you all recently released some data. Sure. $2,500, the, the family income is down for mm -hmm. the Hispanic population. 2.5 million more Latinos in poverty mm -hmm. than before. And Yet you say this is America's most entrepreneurial demographic. It doesn't seem that way, Rachel. You know, it's really interesting. I think when they're when they're given the choice, so we see that there's a, there's a group of people out there really pushing entitlements, dependency, all these things that sort of zap people's drain them of their drain dignity. them of their of their original vision for coming here, of their self initiative. Mm -hmm. um, but when you present the American dream, and we do that in our, we have a series called Share the Dream. You can go to the website. You can see. In fact, one of the I'm stories. I'm going to show it to you. In one yeah, second. one of the stories is my family story. Yeah. When they see that, and we've pulled it, it's amazing. It, it's just you. You can't even compare it. They still want it. They still like it. And in fact, if you pull non-Hispanics, the general yeah. population, ask them if they think the next generation will do better than they are. They'll say. No, I, I'm not. They're very pessimistic. Hispanics remain extremely optimistic. They're very bullish on the American dream. They want it. The problem is there is a group out there trying to push the agenda that the American dream is dead, mm. that it's rigged. And if you think the dream is dead, then it makes sense to take the check, to take the assistance. So this, this Share the Dream initiative is not the Dream Act. It's no. the, dr the American dream you're trying to. We're talking. We're promoting the idea of of showing, um, really the the whole country, not just Hispanics, mm -hmm. really positive stories of people who have actually come and 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 overcome hardships, overcome poverty, and and created that American dream for their family. I mean, your family is one of them. Sure. I mean, in one generation, it's astounding. It really yeah. is only in America. And it's a story that we still need to um, tell. And that we take for granted. I want to give people a, yes. little, a little smidgen sure, of absolutely. this. Here's uh, part of the Shared the Dream campaign, Libre's initiative. As a mother of six, nothing is more important to me than my family. My dad's family came from Mexico. He grew up very poor. With that poverty, came a sense of resourcefulness. He uh, figured out at a very young age that with hard work and ingenuity, he could have a better life. I know how hard my dad worked. I don't want my kids to lose that work ethic. I think kids are growing up in a time when this sense of entitlement and dependency on government is starting to take over. And that's why I joined Libre. We are on the ground, in the communities, offering programs that empower people. We're fighting for the freedom and opportunity that make the American dream possible. What do you hope people's reaction will be to this? What are you all looking for? I, I, I'm hoping that Hispanics will go back and take pride in, in, in what we do best. No, mm -hmm. You can say whatever you want about Hispanics, but nobody can challenge our work ethic. Mm -hmm. We have an incredible work ethic. We're willing to sacrifice tremendously for the next generation. Mm -hmm. um, remember it's Marco Rubio who said, you know, my, my father, yeah. you know, worked in the back of the room behind a bar so I could be in the front of the room behind a podium. Mm -hmm. That's the American dream story. That's a story that I'm afraid we're gonna lose if we forget why we came here. And also, if we start going down this path of entitlement, bigger government, more dependency. Our first Latino pope is the one who said, man earns his dignity by earning his bread. There are positive benefits of work, not just in being more prosperous, mm -hmm. but truly it's part of the human condition in, in earning our dignity 
and feeling good about ourselves and having happiness mm -hmm. and having the money to be able to share that with other yeah. people, which is, um, you know, a, a whole other aspect of happiness. Now, before I let you go, you mentioned the Pope. The Pope this past weekend in the Sistine Chapel, he was <laughs> baptizing <laughs> all these babies. They're crying out. And during his homily, I guess it was impromptu, he says, look, these are the most important people in the room. Go ahead and feed them. Feed them if you have to. Now, this is being blared across the, the landscape Yay! of the media. The Pope says, <laughs> breastfeed in the Sistine Chapel, says Pope Francis. You would say what? Well, Raymond, you what may, message you may or send? may not like to know this, but I breastfeed in mass um, modestly. Yeah. But I think that he's absolutely right. Um, Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus said, feed the poor, <laughs> feed the hungry. Um, you so know, you're doing all of the above I'm doing one all time. of it right there in, in Mass. I, you know, this is the human touch that people are, are really responding to. I mean, mm -hmm. how many moms out there have sat in Mass and, and they, the baby's crying and they, they still want to be in Mass? It's like, this is natural. I mean, I, I imagine the Virgin Mary sat in the, oh, sure. you know, and she breastfed. Yeah. What is wrong with it? If you're doing it modestly, you're doing something that's um, important. And I just think it's so great. I mean, he really is a man of the people. Okay, we'll leave it there. Rachel Campos Duffy. <laughs> you can follow Rachel's work at the Libre Initiative and learn more about the Share the Dream campaign at thelibreinitiative.com. Well, that's all the time we have until next week. The show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter. The links are on my website. By the way, if you sign up for the free e-blast, I'll send you exclusive content and the latest news. Go to the center of the website page, RaymondArroyo.com. To all my librarian friends, I'm going to be at the American Library Association's Midwinter Meeting in Philadelphia on Saturday, January 24th, and I know some of you will be coming. I'll be signing sneak peek copies of the forthcoming first book of my middle grade series, Kerman Derman and the Relic of Perilous Falls. So if you're coming to the ALA, drop by and see me on Saturday, January 24th at booth 540 at the Pennsylvania Convention Center. I'll be there at 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. All the info is at RaymondArroyo.com. In the meantime, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. We'll see you next week. We have a special preview of a new film, Gimme Shelter, and my exclusive interview with its star, Vanessa Hudgens, and the woman on which it's based, Kathy DeFiore. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. See you next time. Bye now.